scientist at the California Academy of Sciences. Now, in your talk, you talked about uh, your colleagues when you were a young scientist sort of deterring you from exploring sea turtles uh, in, in the Baja. Okay. And you managed to, despite that feedback, um, successfully recover or help recover the sea turtle population. So how did you go about convincing the folks who were fishing for sea turtles and eating sea turtles and making it part of their lifestyle and part of their diet to change that behavior? I think in the early days of the project, we um, we realized that there's a common a common theme. Nobody wanted sea turtles to go extinct. The turtle fishermen, the turtle hunters, the turtle consumers, the scientists, the conservationists, we all shared that as a, you know, a common ground. So that's always where we we began conversations, and um, by bringing people together who had never been invited to come to meetings or participate in science, um, it uh, played into sort of what I can best describe as dignity and to be invited to a meeting to talk about the future of an important species to them and, and to us and to the world um, was a new new experience and it felt good to them and as we started to discuss what the possibilities were for protecting the turtles those ideas emerged from that that collective conversation rather than from up on high from the authorities and so it just we started well you know we got we got out the gate uh, with a jump and uh, by by doing some things right and not because we had a, a rule book or a, you know a guide um, but because I guess we were just um, used the golden rule I guess what you could say it's just how if I were a turtle fisherman in Baja, how would I like uh, a, a gringo scientist to address me? And then we would proceed that way. And, and what tools did you provide them at first to perform citizen science and perform counts and measurements? Well, the first uh, wave of monitoring projects, we, uh, we shared calipers, nice big tree calipers to measure big turtles, um, tags, and the pliers to put the tags on, uh, data sheets, um, cameras, flashlights, and a very modest stipend for food and for gasoline. And it turns out that going out and doing this activity maps nicely onto uh, sort of the more traditional turtle hunting techniques, except in our case, you tag them and throw them back into the ocean, and in the other case, you haul them, haul them off and make soup. <laughs> uh, and so it was a... Um, I think for a, a, a lot of the fishermen, it was a, um, a use of their skills in a productive way that they thought uh, may have been a closed door because of the, the laws. Uh, and those skills had become illegal. And here was an opportunity to use their knowledge and their skills in a productive manner. Uh, that, yeah, I've been told that that was, that was an, an appealing aspect of the work. And if you started off your talk with a poem, um, and you obviously have a strong connection between both science and art. Where'd that come from? Yeah, I think you you can't really separate creativity uh, and art from from science. I think my my best ideas as, as a scientist have come from you know unusual circumstances and synergies, or talking to non scientists, or uh, reading poetry. Um, and so I, I think just through the practice of being interested in art and and being inspired by it, and that inspiration being useful. Uh, to the creative process of science, uh, I just have never, never separated the two. Mm -hmm.